Well, good evening once again, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining in with us here as we're going through the book of Proverbs, and we're talking about our weekly Wednesday wisdom. Man, again, I love this book so much as it talks about things right where we are and right where we live. The stuff we're going to talk about today is something that will hit home with a lot of us in, in some general ways, but in some specific ways, we're going to talk about some very serious things, some things that have destroyed homes. We're talking about things that have destroyed lives, uh, whether that be um, you know, socially speaking, talking about the family unit, or whether that even be physically. Folks, there's some very, very serious warnings that the author of this book, Solomon, is giving to his son today. So what we're going to do, let's take our Bibles, you can join with me, and we're going to be in Proverbs chapter number 5. Proverbs chapter number 5 is today we're going to talk about temptation. We're going to talk about temptation, and specifically in this verse, it's talking about a very, um, a very specific kind of temptation. This temptation of lust. This temptation of lust. So let's go ahead and take our Bibles. We'll be in Proverbs chapter number 5. And I'll start reading right here in verse number 1. We'll end up going through the whole chapter. I might not read it all right now, but we are going to go through the whole chapter. And there's some things here I want us to see and I want us to learn. So Proverbs chapter number 5 and verse number 1. Son, attend to my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet goeth down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of her life, her ways are movable, thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh into the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor to others, and thine years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed." And say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. Now we're going to stop there. We'll finish the rest of it in a few minutes. Lord, I pray that you would help everyone that would listen to this, have an adequate understanding of the temptations that are found in the flesh, in this life. Lord, the destruction and the consequences of it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to adequately understand this wise words that we see here today. And it's in your name. Amen. Folks, I'm not going to labor for a lengthy amount of time on this, but I do want us to understand the importance of having our eyes for only one person. That's for our spouse. See, what he's saying right here, this guy, Solomon, he's very specifically and very frankly just saying, Hey, son, keep your eyes away from other women. And you're going to see here in a few minutes how he's talking about this would be to a husband. Hey, son, keep your eyes only on your wife. You don't need to have eyes for anyone else. Folks, it's, it's an amazing thing to see today how, and to, to again be very frank with it, how sexual sins have gone absolutely rampant in our society today, haven't they? Man, it's everywhere. I mean, you turn on TV and sitcoms are making jokes about how a man is running around with another woman on his wife and maybe he gets caught or something. That would be a theme of a TV show. You know, we, we've seen it in the, our friends and family. You know, we'll, we'll know of some situation of someone we've known, he ends up cheating on his spouse or she cheats on him or whatever and ends up ruining their homes, doesn't it? And Solomon is telling his son, son, keep your eyes on one person, your wife. Why? Because it will ruin you if you don't. So what he starts doing is this. He starts talking about how true and how real the temptation is. Maybe some of us would think, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll never be tempted. I'll never have to worry about falling into that temptation. Really? Because sometimes that temptation, it looks really good. He said it himself. You saw it right there in Proverbs chapter number 5. He talks about it in verse number 3. For the lips of a strange woman 
it drops as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. It's talking about how he's talking to his son. He's saying, look, son, don't be tipped by other women. He's, so he's speaking from the male standpoint of this. He's saying, son, look, when you see these other women, they will come to you, and there may be a day when they are even actively seducing you. Folks, we can't pretend that doesn't happen. It does. Men will seduce other women that are married, and women will also seduce other men that are already married, and they will try to lure other people into these traps. And when that temptation comes, he says, look, it's going to look good. When she speaks, her voice will be sweet. It'll be soft. Her words will be kind. They'll be seductive. It'll be like words dropping as honeycomb out of her mouth. It'll be sweet. It'll sound good. And he says, when you look at her lips, her lips will be as if they are covered in oil. They'll be smooth. It'd be pleasant to look at. He's saying, son, you're going to see these things and that temptation will sound good. Son, it may be a situation where you will want that. You may lust after that. And that is not okay. You need to beware of the strange woman. Now, if I can broaden this up for a little bit, he's talking about the strange woman, but can we say that that would also be true of temptation in general? Now, this isn't a general passage. He's speaking specifically about the lips of a strange woman. But let me tell you, this is the way temptation works. Temptation is something that we will see that gets put into our lives that we say, I want that. I need this. This is, this is what I long for. And it may be some kind of sin. It may be something that will be absolutely against what God would have for us. You know, God was very specific in His Word. His design for the home was for a man and a woman to be married and for them to live out that life in a home and to have children and to bring those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that is one family unit for one life. That is God's perfect plan. But folks, it's sad to say it's amazing to see how sin can ruin some of these things, isn't it? It is. So as we continue on, he begins to talk about how, yeah, that temptation, it's, it's there. The temptation is real. And folks, what, all of us want, what I want for all of us is the same thing that Solomon wanted for his son. I want you to recognize the temptation. I want you to recognize it when it comes. Sir, if you see some kind of lady on the job site and you begin to have eyes for her and say, man, she's, she's a pretty nice gal, you know? And it might not have gone into anything too far. It may just be that initial thought. Boy, she's a nice gal. And then maybe she ends up starting getting close to you as well. I mean, we can't pretend like these things don't happen. They do. It is in that moment we must recognize this is a temptation. This is a lure that will lead me into sin. We have to recognize the temptation when it comes. And sometimes that's a very real temptation we feel in our own hearts. Again, I'm not going to pretend like like that lust isn't a feeling. We may actually feel some kind of thing going on deep down inside, but do you realize your emotions can be wrong? Sinful, I mean. Yeah. You can have a sinful emotion. You know, what about when you uh, blow your top and you lose your temper towards someone? Anger can be used in a righteous and just way. Yes, I recognize that. But if I lose my temper and allow that emotion to overtake me and control me, now that's completely out of hand. You see, we can't just always trust our emotions, our gut reactions. We can't do that. Especially if it relates to something like this and me falling after a temptation. That's not okay. So beware of the temptation. Well, why, Pastor? Why is this such a big deal? Well, then he begins to show us what the consequences are. Let's keep reading. I want to to show it to you again. Verse number 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way from her, and come not nigh to the door of her house. Stay away! Why? Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thine years unto cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Verse number 11. 
And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. Folks, what he's saying is this, is he's kind of narrating what you will say if you fall into this temptation. If you go back to verse number 4, it talks about how this woman, her, her uh, end is bitter as wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Folks, let's talk about the consequences. Because here at the end, if you do this, he's saying, oh, there will be a day when you say, oh, why did I despise my teachers? Why did I go the wrong way? Why did I do this? Why is my flesh and my world consumed? There are very real consequences to falling into this temptation. Probably more appropriate to say there are very real consequences to acting upon this sin. Because that's what it is. It's an action upon sin. So what are those consequences? Well, I want you to think about it for yourself. What have you seen around you? And then when you recognize these, you'll see him talking about it. What are some of the actions of someone that goes after a strange woman or maybe even a strange man if it's a lady for whatever reason? What are some of the consequences? Well, I'll tell you this. It'll ruin your home. It is, it is rare, very, very rare that a home is ever patched back together after this sin. When a spouse gets eyes for someone else and leaves their family for another person. They may come back and repent. But that scar, even if it does repair, that scar will always be there. That's kind of irreparable. The scar is. I mean, you may be able to patch things up, and by the way, by, and through the grace of God, that can happen. I believe that. I believe that a person can cheat on a marriage and that marriage relationship can still work by the grace of God. I believe that's the only way. But I do believe that can happen. However... It's very rare that it does. Our sin, our sin just seems to usually take control and win out over those things. But that would be for a different message. Point being, we're talking about the consequences of it. Folks, most often we see that it ends up ruining homes. It ruins lives. I mean, the reputation of that person after they do that, I mean, good night with how, with how fast word travels now with Facebook and, and telephones and texting, whatever. I'll tell you, did you hear about this and this? I remember one specifically that happened to me. I was, I was driving on the road. I was in between visiting churches, and I had a good friend of mine call me up on the phone, and he said, hey, did you hear about this situation? And my, and my friend was crying. He was crying. He was brokenhearted. He said, hey, did you hear about this situation? It's like, no, what are you talking about, man? And then he gave me some bad news about a friend of mine that, that was in this exact same situation. And, folks, the consequences that came with that I mean, I think probably it's one of those things innumerable. We'll never really fully know the consequences of that until, well, maybe until we're with the Lord. But the point being, the ruin and the destruction. There's another, another friend of mine that happened with his, his, his own family I'm thinking of right now. He was, he was a young man at the time, and, and he lost his dad. His dad went after someone else, and as far as, far as I can tell, I've never seen or heard of the man ever again. And I'm not saying that to, um, you know, to get to be a jerk, but I'm just saying we know of these, these things, don't we? We've heard these stories. Probably all of you have heard a similar story or know of a similar story. So when we say that, look at what the man is saying in verse number 11. And thou mourn at the last. After you have gone the way of the strange woman and fell in that temptation, you will mourn. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. We'll talk about that in a minute. And say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the minds of the congregation and assembly. He's saying once you go that route and once you look back at the wake of destruction that that has left behind, you will say to yourself, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I listen to the wise counsel that they gave me? Why didn't I just tell that woman, no! 
Why didn't I just tell myself? No. I hated that instruction. Talking about he despised it. Folks, it'll leave behind death and destruction for your home, for your life, for your reputation. You will have things that will never be repaired until the day you die because we walked into sin. We allowed ourselves to go the way of that temptation. Can I say one even here very specifically? And I'll, use, and I'll quote another man on this here in just a moment. In, um, in verse number 10, he says, Let strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Talking about giving yourself over to strangers. And thou mourn the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. I find this one very interesting. He's talk, talking about the physical body. Your flesh and your body are consumed. I was listening to a message not long ago. Maybe some of you have, have heard of him. And I'll, I'll quote him in this because this is not original with me. He said, all, all across America today, people are talking about having safe sex. This was a man named Adrian Rogers. And you know, Adrian Rogers, he was a pastor out in Tennessee for a number of years, and he's, many of his messages are still available online. You can go listen to him. Um, I highly recommend him. He's a good pastor. And he was, he was warning his very same congregation about something similar. He was warning them about a, a similar message in the Bible, and he was saying, all across America, we're talking about uh, safe sex and how, how things need to be done in a safe way so that you don't get hurt. And then he said this, and this stuck. He said, physical relationships done, done God's way were never meant to be dangerous. Having these relationships done in accordance with God's design are not dangerous. So why should we have to consider it being done in a safe way? It's already safe. It gets dangerous when you get outside the bounds of the way God had it designed. And so what have we seen from that? I mean, go ahead, think to yourself. Well, what have we seen? What kind of physical destruction have we seen because of things getting outside of the bounds of marriage? We've seen physical destruction, haven't we? We've seen physical destruction, destruction of the body. I'm talking about sicknesses and diseases. That is a thing that is spread through this getting outside of God's design. Folks, physical intimacy, it is safe. There is nothing you have to do to make it safe because it already is. It's when you start twisting things up outside of the way they were meant to be that we now have to practice it in a safe way. Folks, it's a fabrication. It's, it's the world trying to fix what they've already messed up. And so Solomon said this to his son thousands of years ago. Already we have it right here in the Bible in the Old Testament. He says, son, don't be seduced by the strange woman. It will be tempting. It will be something that will cause you to have lustful feelings. It will look good. It will sound good. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Her feet will take hold on hell, the Bible says. When we allow ourselves to go into some kind of temptation, it will give us family ruin. It can give us physical ruin. It can give us social ruin. It will bring us to the point when we look at this world and we will say, well, I've got nothing else to live for. I've seen people there in that spot where because of their quick choice, they literally say to themselves, I have nothing else to live for. My life is ruined. And folks, Solomon knew that then. And he was warning his sons then. And that warning still applies to us today. There's a very real temptation. There's very real consequences. And can I at the end now show you about how there's protection from this? Oh man, pastor, you're talking about something here that's going to ruin my entire life. Yeah, I am. Now let me show you how to protect yourself. Let me give you some safeguards. Let me give you some shields that will keep you from ever going this route. Let's continue reading. We're going to go right here to verse number 15. Solomon told his son this. He said, Son, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. 
Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die with the instruction. And in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. So folks, at the end, I just want to give you these last few verses, and you can mark these in your Bible. I want you to understand there is a protection. You know, Paul mentioned here something very candidly over in the New Testament as well. He said, hey, it's better to marry than to burn. Talking about how you can have a wife and you can have a husband, and this family unit will protect you from these other sins. Folks, that's one of the amazing things about a marriage relationship. There is absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with intimacy between a husband and a wife. It, one, one, um, one author put it this way. He's like, you know, that, that kind of relationship between a man and a woman, that physical relationship, he said it's like a fire. Man, you put that in your home and you put that in a fireplace and you start that fire, it gives you light, it gives you warmth. It can take care of your house. You can cook on it. It's a wonderful thing. But if you let that fire get out of the firebox, it'll burn your house to the ground. You see, that desire is something that God put within us. We could say, humanly speaking, we need fire, don't we? Hey, we live here in, uh, we live in Montana, right? We know what it means to get 30 below zero. And when that happens, I hope you've got some kind of furnace. I mean, you need some kind of heat. I, if we don't have that heat, we die. So it's an adequate description when we say that physically speaking, we have this desire that God put within us as people. And that is a beautiful and a wonderful thing. That is a gift that we ought to be thankful for. However, that's for one person. That is for your spouse. So what Solomon is telling his son is this. He's saying, son, when you're thirsty, go get some water out of your own well. Don't go somewhere else. And that's, he's talking about very specifically that analogy. Look at verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. So using this analogy of needing water and being thirsty, he says, look, if you are married, this needs to be out of your own wife. And then he goes very specifically talking about your own wife. He's like, look, this is your wife. Man, you fell in love with her. You need to be ravished by her. Man, she, she is going to be the one that pleases you. She's going to be the one that makes you happy. She's going to be the one that you hold on to. Man, she's yours. And go to your wife. Be ravished only with her, and vice versa for wives too. He's writing this to his son. He talks about being, keeping that relationship here within, within your home, where it's supposed to. And folks, the idea behind that is this. If you're drinking enough water, you're not going to be thirsty to go find it somewhere else. You see where I'm going with this? I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to not to be crass. But you understand what I'm saying. If you drink waters out of your own well and you are full and you're not thirsty and you are cleaving to your wife and you too are one flesh and you are living as one flesh and you are dwelling together as one flesh, you will find yourself protected from the strange woman. You'll have no need to go looking elsewhere. You'll have no need to find eyes for someone else. You'll have no need to go looking for fulfillment somewhere else. Why? Because you're fulfilled in your own home. If my home, and I'll finish with this thought, and, and I do have one of these. I have a, an actual wood fire stove in my living room. Man, I love that thing. It gives me some good warmth. You talk about that wood heat. I love wood heat. 
And I'll start that firebox, and man, it'll get warm, and my house has a warmth. And can I tell you something? There is no place that I would rather be on a wet, cold winter night than to be in my house sitting by my fire. That's my house. It's warm. I can sit, I can read a book. <laughs> if, if it's quiet enough in my house, I can sit and I can read a book. And if the power goes out, nah, it's okay. Even better. I can just sit by that wood fire and I can be there with my family and we can talk. I have no desire to leave my house and to go out into the cold and try to find warmth somewhere else. Why? Because my house has already got it. And folks, if we are being fulfilled and we are fulfilling one another, husbands and wives, in our own homes, then we will not, or we ought not rather, to have a desire to go looking for warmth somewhere else. You see how that works? And we'll, we'll not turn there for sake of time, but if you were to go over to the book of Corinthians, Paul speaks on this more and talks about how we ought not to defraud one another. I ought not to withhold myself from my wife and vice versa. You know, that, that would be talking about the water illustration again. That would be like my wife saying, hey, I need some water. And I'm saying, no, I'm not going to give you any. You know. Why? Folks, it's the bonds of marriage. It is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And as Solomon was having this talk and writing these words here to his son, so ought we to talk about this because it's in God's Word and we need to apply them to our lives as well. I say this to us from the sense of a protection. I don't want any of us to face the consequences that were talked about here in the Scripture. I don't want that. I, I don't want you to have homes that are ruined. I don't want you to have reputations that are ruined. I don't want you to get so far down the road and have everything you built just fall apart because you had eyes for someone that wasn't yours. I don't want that for you. So I'm begging and pleading with you and giving you God-specific directions this morning because it comes out of His book. Keep your eyes on your own wife. Keep your eyes on your own husband. Don't go looking elsewhere. You need to be ravished with your own spouse. You, you ought to have... You ought to have that fulfillment from your own spouse. And don't go looking elsewhere. Folks, why is that? Very simply, it says it here and we'll be done. Verse number four, because if you have eyes for someone else, her end is bitter as wormwood and sharper than a two-edged sword. Verse number five, and her feet goeth down to death and her steps take hold on hell. That's a pretty powerful metaphor, isn't it? It is. And I think there's probably a good number of us that have even seen it. So I warn you. Keep your eyes on your spouse. Don't go looking. Don't fall into temptation. Don't give in to lust. And in doing so, we will find protection. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we love you. And again, we thank you so much for how good you are to us. I pray that you would help us to heed the words of Solomon this morning and not going after the strange woman. Lord, help us to keep our eyes in our own homes, on our own spouses, the way we ought to. And Lord, above all things, may we seek You for this guidance and for this protection and do things the way that You have given us. Lord, we love You and we thank You. And it's in Your name we pray. Amen.